hear a telephone conversation between a customer and an overseas shipping agent. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 8. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 8. Good afternoon, Denham Shipping. How can I be of service? Well, I wish to inquire about sending a container of personal items from the UK to Ireland. No problem. Would you like me to give you an estimate of the cost? Yes, please. Well, first of all, may I take your details? Of course. My name's Tim Lafferty. Could you spell your surname for me, please, Tim? Yes, it's Lafferty. L-A-F-F-E-R-T-Y. Thank you, Tim. Now, where would you like us to pick your container up from? My university, if possible. OK. Let me make a note of the address. It's Abbeyfield University. Is that A-B-B-E-Y-F-I-E-L-D? That's right. Park Street, Brighton. Perfect. And may I take down your postcode, too? It's B-R-8-9-P-3. Great. Thank you, Tim. Have you the container's measurements? I do. It's approximately 2.5 metres long by 1.25 metres wide. I see. Quite a big one, then. Indeed. And the height? I make it a metre and 20 centimetres deep. So that's 2.5 by 1.25 by 1.2. Right. And what will actually be in the box, Tim? Oh, mostly old uni books. OK. And some music albums. Anything else? Yes, a little bit of stationery. I see. And could you put an estimate on the value of the items? The books are quite valuable. They're worth around £1,800. The music albums, maybe half that, say £900. And you can put the stationery down as £300. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 9 and 10. Now listen and answer questions 9 and 10. OK. And will you be purchasing contents cover from us also? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Sorry, let me explain. Because your items are worth more than £2,000, we recommend that you purchase insurance to cover yourself in the event of damage or loss. Makes sense. What are my options? Well, we offer three insurance deals. The premium rate, standard rate and economy rate ones. Premium offers full cover in the event of loss, damage or theft, which means you would be provided with the full cost of replacing your belongings. What about standard and economy? Standard will give you today's value. 
the second-hand value of your belongings, and economy provides you with a fixed payment of £1,000 in the event of loss, damage or theft. Well, I can afford to live without those books, to be honest. So just give me the cheapest option. We recommend standard cover for all our customers. No, thank you. That won't be necessary. The cheapest option will be fine. No problem. And one last thing. Will you be needing delivery at your office, at your house, or do you intend to pick up your container at the port? Home delivery would suit me best, I think. We'll get that process for you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear someone talking about travelling around New Zealand. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 15. When thinking about beautiful countryside or stunning views, it has long been accepted that Australia and New Zealand have few equals. What is perhaps slightly less well known is what these countries can offer to the avid train enthusiast. Both countries have railways which pass through breathtaking scenery in the utmost of comfort. In New Zealand, you can travel from the country's biggest city, Auckland, to where a third of the population lives, its capital, Wellington, on the longest passenger rail service in the country, the Overlander. Crossing 681 kilometres, the train winds through the lush farmland of the Waikato and up the Rarumu Spiral onto an amazing volcanic plateau surrounded by native bush. On a clear day, you will be able to see three of New Zealand's most famous volcanoes, Mount Ruapehu, Mount Narahoe, and Mount Tongariro. The whole journey can be completed in 11 hours, but for those keen to see a little more of the country, the trip can be extended over three or four days. This gives travellers the opportunity of seeing the famous Waitomo Caves, relaxing in the mud pools of Rotorua, or skydiving over Lake Taupo. Moving on to the South Island, you can take the Transalpine through the Southern Alps, travelling from the South Pacific Ocean to the Tasman Sea. Climbing from Christchurch right into the Alps, this 223 km trip is particularly impressive as the train passes through 16 tunnels before descending to Greymouth at the end of the line. Taking only 5 hours, this is a relatively short trip, but it is worth noting that this journey has been listed as the sixth most scenic rail route in the world. For those that are not so keen on mountains, the South Island has a second option, the Transcoastal. With the sea on one side and the mountains on the other, it again shows some of the best scenery New Zealand has to offer. Also taking five hours, one of the highlights of this journey is the opportunities for whale watching. The fortunate few that see whales are well rewarded, but there are more common sights which are just as enjoyable, such as penguins and seals. Before you hear the rest of the recording, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Although these three train journeys are undeniably breathtaking, some travellers prefer the longer journeys on offer in Australia. The Indian Pacific, for example, which travels from Sydney through to Perth and has been dubbed the adventure that spans Australia. With three nights on board, the train takes in the Blue Mountains and the Nullarbor Plains, and, as the name implies, the Indian Pacific shows you two oceans. This train journey holds two world records. Covering 4,352 kilometres, it is one of the world's longest train journeys. It also travels the world's longest straight stretch of railway track, 478 kilometres. For those who find these distances a little daunting, passengers can stretch their legs at a number of different stops, such as Kalgoorlie, famous for gold, and Broken Hill, first founded as a silver mine. If three days on board a train seems a little excessive, there are alternatives. The Garn, for example, which travels from Adelaide in the south to Alice Springs in the centre of the continent, taking 20 hours. Passing through Crystal Brook, Port Augusta and Woomera, this journey gives an indication of what life was like for the earlier settlers as they discovered the country. Along the way, you can also see the Iron Man sculpture, which was constructed by railway workers to commemorate the one millionth concrete sleeper laid during the construction of the line. Finally, just a quick word about the Overland, which runs between Melbourne and Adelaide. As the first train to travel between the capitals of two states, it is a historic as well as relaxing way to travel, and is famous for being the oldest long-distance train journey on the continent. With so many memorable journeys to choose from, the only problem you will have is knowing which one to do first. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a conversation between Astrid and Henry about the lecture they've just heard. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Henry, don't you think Dr. Adam's lecture was really very good? He could talk about the telephone directory and make it interesting. All his lectures are like that, Astrid. He's just one of those people. I wish we had him as our tutor. I bet you that he is very demanding, though. Boris is in his tutorial group and agrees that he is brilliant. But he puts them under a lot of pressure. Hmm. But don't you think that's good? Perhaps. Anyway, he's interesting and rather funny. Did you take lots of notes in the lecture? Yes, actually I did. In fact, several pages. I didn't think I had taken so many. I was that busy listening to what was being said that I didn't take many notes. Can I photocopy yours? I don't think that's such a good idea. You won't be able to read my handwriting. And sometimes I write them in English and sometimes in Arabic. Oh, let's have a look. Wow, your notes are so neat. Well, there's not much in Arabic. There is on this page. <laughs> yes, there is. Dr. Adams would be pleased to see this, especially given what he's talking about. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Don't you keep careful notes? Mm, sometimes. It depends on the lecture. I don't think I'll forget Adams' lecture today, but some of the details will fade. I type up everything afterwards, so you can have a copy then, and you can fill in anything I've missed. I'm not so good on the broader concepts. I'm better when it comes to detail. Just what Adams was talking about. Well, I am definitely a detail person. I need to have everything written down before I can get the concepts clear in my head. And I am the complete opposite. I find all the detail clutters up my mind, and I get very frustrated, which was just what he was on about. He mentioned a book he had written. He mentioned several. The one on space and the individual. Yes, called My Space. It's on the book list. Hmm, so it is. I think I'll get that out of the library, or get my own copy. Did you get what he said about spatial awareness? I didn't, really. Yes, it was fascinating. I can't be as eloquent as Adams was, but I know several people who are frighteningly intelligent, but they have difficulty reading simple directions, even when getting to places that they know very well. I find that difficult to understand. Everyone learns the way to walk to the shops and things like that. You mean just the way people learn spelling. You know, people misspell words, make mistakes in countless areas of their lives, and going in the right direction is just the same. Remember what Adam said about the number of people who cannot tell left from right, north from south, and so on? Do you know which way is north? Um, it's that way. <laughs> you see, I couldn't have told you that. Really? I haven't a clue which way is which. That's why I'm always getting lost when I go out on my bike. And put me in a completely new place, and I am totally lost. What about maps? Oh, I'm hopeless at reading them. But then you're brilliant at writing essays and getting all the ideas down in the right order, and I don't know where to start. Again, just what Adams was talking about. What we need to do is combine our skills. You teach me to cope with detail, and I'll teach you how to string concepts together. OK, we can do that. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a tutor giving some business students instructions about a finance project. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. OK, can you quieten down, please? Now, today, I'm going to talk to you about your assignment. We've been studying the effects of the exchange rate, so I'm going to give you a project to do on this. Right, can you make some notes while I'm talking? The first thing that I'd like you to do in order to prepare this is to select where you're interested in. I mean, which country, and therefore, which currency you're going to be operating in. OK, now, the purpose of the project is to make money, and I'm hoping some of you will make a significant amount. So, I want you to suppose that you have £100 that you will have to invest purely in the rises and falls of the exchange system. In other words, you'll be trying to predict rates. This is a project that you'll be doing together, but before you work together, 
You'll have to go off and research what you need to know about the economy of that country and how well it's doing or is expected to do in the near future. You could all make up a little information sheet with your notes on, clearly legible, because then I want you to get together, we can do that next week, and to go round and read about each other's countries. When you see how well or badly each country is doing, I want you to decide what your exchange rate is going to be against all the other currencies. After that is all sorted, what you're going to do is go around the other students and attempt to sell your money to the others. Remember, this will depend on the success of your country's economy and the rate you fixed for your currency. Now, you're not allowed to just swap currencies with each other, but you may wish to buy from the other countries. But you must do a proper transaction. All the way through this, you must keep your accounts properly for each transaction. I'll give you one week to do this, and then we will set a time for the deals to finish, a bit like the stock exchange. And, at that point, I will ask you to calculate how much you have made. Is that clear? You now have 30 seconds to read questions 37 to 40. OK, now before you begin that, there are a few things I want you to read up on to prepare. You need to look at the economies of the UK's main trading partners. I don't mean all of them, because that would be over 80, but just the 29 principal ones. There are summaries in the last three books on the book list I've given you. And so that you can practice applying the criteria on assessment I gave you, I'd then like you to focus just on one sector across all the countries. The most common one across every country is farming. But as much agricultural produce is for domestic consumption, I'd like you to look at manufacturing. Then I would like you to do a detailed investigation of one particular aspect. I was going to give you a choice, but I think as we've just started the course, it's better if we all look at the same thing and then we can discuss it in the seminars. So the thing I'd like you all to look at is fluctuations in import prices. Now, you need to do all that before you start the project as it will help you assess the economies of the countries you'll be representing in the project. Don't worry, you've got plenty of time. Exam week is December the 8th, then it's the holidays until January the 6th, so I don't need the project in till February the 5th. Is that okay? Now, any questions on this? Because it's That is the end of part four.